Let me introduce myself first. My name is Luca Balsani of Electromedia, the parent company of Audison, and I will be your host for this webinar series. I have studied electronics. I'm a passionate traveler, and I've been in international sales for 25 years. I have lived in many places, but I came back home to East Coast of Italy, and I currently serve as an export manager for the Asia Pacific markets in this company. I spent a lot of time learning the preferences and needs of car audio specialists around the world. And I decided transferring my experience on Audison products into this series. But now, let me welcome our special guest. Very happy to have with us one of the leading experts in the infotainment and car audio sector of North America, live from Portland, Oregon. Please welcome Mr. Ken Ward. Today I have many things to share and questions to ask you. I'm happy to help and I hope to be up to the task. I am sure of this. Before starting, let me remind our guests the next episodes and the contents we will be sharing. As shown on the image on the screen, this series is composed by six episodes of about 45 minutes duration each. This is the first one and will broadcast live every other Wednesday, 10 a.m. Pacific time for the US and 7 p.m. for Central Europe. Now, the frequencies of the events have changed. Instead of an episode every week, we will broadcast every two weeks as we have been receiving requests from all over the world for slowing down the episodes. Starting today, 16th of September, 30th of September, the second one, 14th of October, 28th of October, 11th of November and 25th of November for the last one. For those who are already registered for the weekly events, we'll send you the updated webinar links. Don't miss any of it. All of them are important and rich of contents. Now that we have shared our next week's agenda, let's start over this journey. One first curiosity I have, Ken, how did you become a specialist in this area? Well, I started in car audio in the mid 1980s and OEM head units were not very advanced at all. And so I didn't actually start measuring OEM head unit signals until 2003, which I guess is now 17 years ago. 2003 is a quite a long time ago. By the way, did you know that Electromedia started dealing with head unit adaptability much earlier in time? I am sure the code name HP110 does not sound familiar to you, right? No, not really. What is that? The HP110 is the first Audison amplifier with adjustable sensitivity. The only one in the world compatible with all the existing sources in that period, including OEX signals. It was year 1984. Wow, 36 years ago, I was graduating from high school and you guys were already doing in-car integration. Yeah, 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 yeah. So seriously, when I visited Audison's facility recently in Italy, I got to see a lot of the products that you folks have brought to market over the years that had, uh, that were firsts. Could you just take a second and tell us about some of these products? Okay, let's go quickly through our history of innovation and progress. In the next image, you can see three dreamers. Their dream was to build the best car audio amplifier in the world. It was year 1979, and this is where the story begins. It took three years to come out with the first Audison branded amplifier, the CA800. It was year 1982, and the Italian national team of football won the World Cup. For the US, it's soccer. <laughs> yeah. As mentioned earlier, in year 1984, it came out the HP 110 the first amplifier with adjustable sensitivity that was compatible with all the sources in the market at that time. Going on with the progress and innovation, in year 1992 came out the LR3081. By that time, the first specialized subwoofer amplifier. Some year, the same year 1992, a milestone that has changed the history of car audio, the HR100 defined by the specialized press as the amplifier, being the new reference for the mobile IN electronics. With that maniacal care for aesthetic and engineering details, new products were released in the international markets. The HV Sedici has been the first bestseller in the international markets. It was year 1994. 
The VRX series then was the first open deck amplifier where the user could add optional functionalities and accessories. It was also having a device that could be installed to boost the A-class polarization with the click of a button. Going back to legendary products, please meet the HV20, still on sales, reputed by the specialized press as the best mobile amplifier of all times. It was year 2008 when Electromedia felt that there was a need for real innovation, especially from the point of the signal management. So the bit one was the answer to it. The first standalone DSP with full digital audio technology. Progressing in this path, 2014, the AP bit series saw the light. This was the first real eight channel amplifier with DSP and bridgeable channels. The history reaches our times and the last revolutionary news was announced by the end of last year, redefining in-car DSP standards. The Bit1 HD Virtuoso has set new heights for Audison technology achievements. The good news is that the dreamers are still sitting and daily working in the company. And it is only thanks to their passion in our markets and their investment in human resources and research and development that we can afford to keep marking the pace of innovation. And here, where it, the dream has led us, this is a picture of our current facilities celebrating 33 years of innovation. We're still humble when it's time to learn and listen our customers, but very ambitious for product developments and improve our achievements. Well, thanks for showing us those. I really appreciate it. I think there's a lot of people in North America that haven't seen these products and I, I hope they found that interesting. Yeah, that was my pleasure, Ken. In fact, Audison heritage is worth sharing. Sometimes even us forget about how many products and innovation we've done through the years. Now let's go back to your story. You were saying 2003, you started measuring head units. Why were you doing that? Well, my wife bought a car with an OEM navigation system and it was not straightforward to replace it. And even today, the solutions for that car are not, not attractive. Can I ask you which car was it? Oh yeah, it was a 2004 Acura TSX. You can see it here. Outside of North America, that was just a Honda Accord. Uh, so I bought some test gear and I measured the output signal and I figured out how to upgrade the system with a more powerful amplifier and with great speakers. Now in that car, the audio signal was simple, but as I kept measuring more and more OEM systems, the signals kept getting more and more complicated. And eventually I taught my first training class on OEM integration in I think 2007. Now, OEM systems have changed a lot just since then. Uh, fortunately, we have a lot more equipment and a lot more training available now than we did in 2003 or 2007. Yeah, correct. The installation of a good sound system in modern cars often seems impossible to the vehicle owner and very difficult for the car stereo specialist. Back in the 80s, this wasn't true. What has changed really? Well, a lot has changed. I was thinner and I had more hair. <laughs> but on top of that, in the 80s, nobody liked the factory sound in their car, even if it came with a sound system, and many cars did not. And in this picture, you can see a very popular car worldwide, a Volkswagen Golf, had no radio in the dash in some cases. You can just see a pocket in the dash. And if you look in this next picture, which is of a, a Fiat Panda, which we did not have in the U.S., but which was a very popular car in Europe, there isn't even a spot for the radio to fit. Yeah, in the last century, that required a new in-dash receiver. But that wasn't so difficult. Well, no, not back then. But now, all new cars come with a radio and inexpensive speakers, and sometimes they come with premium sound systems. But they do not sound very good. No, they don't, luckily for us. So to answer your original question, the main challenge is that the electronics and the design of the car have changed. And as you can see in this next picture, with modern cars, the in-dash receiver is now distributed around the vehicle. The screen is up here and the buttons are down here and the tuner might be back there. And so there isn't just one single module that we can replace, so it's much harder. And on top of that, there's a lot of non-audio functions that are performed inside this receiver. There's hands-free phone calling, there's navigation, 
there's chimes and safety sounds, and there's also displays from the cameras that appear there. There's telematic service center calls that happen through there, and often they have smartphone interfaces like CarPlay or Android Auto uh, built into them. So the customer may or may not want to change the receiver. The receiver may already do everything that they want, but there's still some people who want better sound. So many people were used to getting better sound when they went to get their new in-dash receiver, they would get new speakers, but it's not that easy any longer. There are roadblocks to getting better sound. Uh, so what are the most common roadblocks to audio upgrades using the OEM head units? Well, when we use an aftermarket head unit, we would get full range stereo sound, just like we would from home audio. And if you got a better head unit, it would sound better. The output of OEM head units used to be the same. We would always get full range stereo sound. Uh, there were some differences. They didn't use standard output connectors or standard output signals, but the sound signal inside was the same. Um, now, if you look at this chart, this is a chart of the commonly accepted range of human hearing. And we're gonna look at a few of these frequency response charts. Let me explain how they work. So we're gonna show the energy at different notes or different frequencies. And the, on these charts, the bass notes can be seen on the left. The mid-range notes are in the middle. And then the treble notes are on the right. And when we see these charts, we often assume that they have been made with a microphone. And microphones actually detect air pressure. But it turns out that the equipment that makes those graphs, which is called a real-time analyzer, measures the voltage that comes out of the microphone. So in the audio world, we use voltage to push speakers around. We send voltage to amplifiers and amplifiers send voltage to speakers. So the real-time analyzer can measure that voltage without any microphone involved at all. So if the measurement of a signal is flat, it means that all the sounds are passed through evenly and the device is treating all the sounds the same. It doesn't emphasize any and it doesn't attenuate any. Now it's important to know speakers in rooms never measure flat. There is always some coloration from the room. There's reflections and there's absorptions. And on top of that, no speaker has a perfectly flat response. Now cassette decks were not flat either. They would attenuate the signal in the low bass and they would attenuate the signal in the upper treble and they often had some deviation up and down in between. This picture here is of the Pioneer cassette deck and the Pioneer amplifier that were in my very first car, a 1976 Audi 100LS when I bought it. It's a very cool system, isn't it? Going back to a flat response, hasn't this been the goal of amplifier and head unit manufacturers for a long time? Yeah, it has because record players and then cassette decks affected the sound too much. And that was the big promise of digital audio that the sound could be uncompromised all the way through. And when CD players came out, they did have that flat response. I recently measured a CD player from back in 1986 and it is still flat from 20 Hertz all the way to 20,000 Hertz. So when OEM systems started equalizing their signals, they were usually trying to make their low performance speakers sound a little better. And some of these signals have a lot of deviation away from flat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, sure, all true what you're saying. And uh, just one thing I would like to highlight, and it's the fact that OEM infotainment nowadays components, such as head unit speaker, OEM amplifiers, are just the result of many compromises done by the car manufacturers. Budget cost range to match with interior design and speaker location, weight reduction to comply the fuel consumption regulation and various others. Yes, you're absolutely right. And we're here to help our customers overcome these compromises and get performance that matches up to what they're expecting from the sound system. So if we can look at the next chart, this is a sample, an example OEM signal. That is and so as you flat. can see, it's yeah. not flat, is it? Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> you can see the first problem is that the sub bass here is attenuated. Then the bass is emphasized. And then after that, they attenuated the upper mid range. Wow. And they also attenuated the upper treble. Quite now, the mess. if that response was supposed to make low performance speakers sound less annoying, it will not let great speakers sound great. Yeah, and I've heard from some car audio specialists 
in the past who installed great speakers into a car. And they knew those speakers were great sounding speakers, but they didn't sound great in that instance. Yeah, in North America, I've heard the same stories and it's even happened to me a few times. Sometimes it is the acoustics of the car. But bit processor address those issues, right? That's right. That's, that's one of the things you can do there. But often the signal that we're using can be the problem. I see. So as an example, if the OEM system could not play low notes, the system may filter low notes out of the signal to keep distortion from happening when bass notes hit. So if you added a subwoofer to improve the bass, but it's using this signal, you still will not get accurate bass if these notes are missing. Here's another example. If the OEM system lacked tweeters, the signal may have been boosted in the trouble to try to make up for the missing tweeters. So in this case, if the specialist then installed tweeters, they would be way too loud, right? Yes, that's right. And it's going to sound really harsh with a good speaker system that can actually play high notes properly. That makes sense. So when car audio specialists first started amplifying the signal coming out of these OEM systems, they would use high performance speakers and high performance amplifiers, but the results would often, they didn't really sound the way we expected. Yeah, everyone was disappointed. So our customers were facing the issue where adding a subwoofer was not helping to improve the bass output. That's why Audison introduced the DEQ function. That's right. Now DEQ is supposed to correct the effects of OEM equalization so that we're closer to sending a flat signal to the speakers when we start tuning the system. So let's take this OEM signal and we apply DEQ to it and it will automatically apply the opposite EQ to flatten out the signal. And you can see we end up getting a flat line again. And we still will not have a flat response in the car because of the cabin acoustics. Yeah, correct. So then you are ready to start tuning the equalizer, but this time having a complete signal ready to be filtered and address it to the new components. Yes, that's right. We also have to remember that sometimes the OEM equalization is dynamic. What does that mean? It means that the equalization changes with the position of the volume knob on the factory radio. And that is often to keep factory speakers from trying to play low bass at high volumes. Um, here's an example from a Volkswagen that I worked on recently, and you can see at low volumes below nine clicks on the volume knob, there is actually boosted bass. And if you turn the volume up to nine clicks, the line becomes flat all the way across. But you go above nine clicks and the volume control goes up to almost 40 clicks. You can see the bass starts to disappear. And this roll off is almost completely where the subwoofer would be doing its work. So you turn up the volume and the low bass gets weaker? Wow, that looks like a big problem. Are you saying that the head unit is changing the condition on which the processor has been tuned? That's right. So the last thing you want is for your sub to disappear when you turn the volume up. Wow, uh, yeah, that's a scenario I would not like to face. And that's also the reason why we have the DRC available for all of our products. Yeah, the DRC concept includes a new master volume control. That's right. You can leave the OEM volume control in one position, correct the signal EQ at that position, and then use the DRC volume control for great sounds at any volume level. Yep, that's how you do it. But in other cars, OEM systems are using multiple amplifier channels and active crossovers, which is a technique we use all the time in the aftermarket. And here's a chart with an example of actively filtered low pass and high pass channels. Would this add further complication then? In these systems, yes, no one channel is full range and sometimes the, it's a problem. So we can sum them and add them back together to a full range signal like this. And that's why bit processors have summing. So you can get a full range signal before you start tuning. Now, Sometimes the factory sound system isn't even using stereo. Uh, what do you mean? Well, let me explain stereo first. So stereo systems have two channels, left and right, and they have to match in loudness, they have to match in time, and they have to match in phase for stereo to work. And for stereo to create that illusion, you need to have these two identical speakers. They need to be arranged mirror image to each other. And we have to sit on the center line in between them like this. Excuse me. 
And when we sit here, what we call the phantom center will appear between the speakers. That's the stereo effect. Got it. And we don't sit in the center position in cars. If we sat there, it would be easy, right? But yeah. we don't sit there. We Read sit on. off to the left or off to the right as if we were sitting on the end of the sofa. And when we do that, you can see in this chart that the instruments on the stage are all jumbled up. So no matter how good our high-end audio equipment is, this listening position is gonna cause us three problems. I call the three problems of car stereo. And the first one is when you're, when you're sitting in the driver's seat, the two sides are not usually the same loudness. We're closer to one speaker than we are the, loud, the other speaker. So you get this. We fix this in bit processors with level controls, right? Yeah, that's right. So the second problem is a little more complicated. The two speakers are no longer arranged at mirror image angles to us. One side speaker is at a very different angle than the other. And this causes the two speakers to sound different, even if they're identical speakers. So on this chart, you can see if we have one speaker with a response that sounds like this, it's full range, it's relatively flat. And then the other speaker sounds like this, it's also full range, it's also relatively flat. But if we look at them both at the same time, we're gonna see they don't match each other. Now, let's assume there's an instrument in the center of the stage and it's playing a mid- pretty good difference between one side and the other. So if we were in the car, the center image would shift toward that side, toward the louder speaker. Now, if the instrument is playing a higher note, like here, you can see that the other speaker is louder. So if we were back in the car and we were sitting in the driver's seat, we would see the image move over to the other side. So the instrument seems to be moving back and forth on the stage all by itself. And it shouldn't, right? So we correct that with bit processor by setting the left and right equalizers differently. So the speakers respond to matches with each other. Is that correct? Yes, that's exactly how you do it. Remember, bit processors are not just for correcting OEM processing. Uh, so I've run into some people that think that. They're also there to optimize the sound for the new system that we have installed. So we can minimize this problem in a car by using better speakers, especially if we use three-way component sets like this. Odison has three-way component sets in every speaker line. This is the APK163 part of the Prima line. So the third problem of car stereo is caused by the fact that the speakers are no longer the same distance from the listener. Uh, sound travels relatively slowly. So even the small differences in a car, like half a meter, will cause problems. And these differences cause phase cancellations. Engineers call that comb filtering. And these cancellations will affect any sound that is intended to come from the center of the stage. This is a graph of the cancellations between the left and right sides in an average size car. Wow, that looks horrible. Right? <laughs> and every one of those dips is caused by the two speakers being different distances from the listener. So sometimes they're 180 degrees out of phase from the listening position. Yeah. Most car audio specialists have connected two subwoofers in opposite polarity at least once. And notice there's no base. Is that an example of a 180 degrees phase cancellation, right? Yeah, that's a great example. So yeah. you cannot equalize those dips away because if you put more boost in on this speaker, the other speaker will travel just as much, but the other direction and the cancellation remains. It's a cancellation problem. Yeah, so for this, we address the problem in the bit processor we delay or time alignment. So we can put all the various speakers back into phase in all frequency, right? Yes, that's right. And delay works great on the third problem of stereo when you're tuning for one specific listening position. This is an example of a driver's seat tune where both channels are in phase with each other. We match the levels, we match the responses, and it sounds great. It is only effective in that one listening position. If you're sitting here in the other listening position, you're, you're kind of out of luck. Yeah. So one of our problems is that OEMs would prefer to have a car audio system that sounds similar in both seats instead of a car audio system which sounds great in one seat and not as good in the other. So 
what they're doing is they often use some processed form of stereo and it is intended to sound similar in more than one seating position in the car. Even if it doesn't sound amazing, it sounds similar. Uh, one of the methods that they use is called up mixing. And it is one of the methods that uses a center channel speaker. Hold on a second. What do you mean by up mixing? Well, let me explain stereo first. Okay. So if stereo creates a phantom center, but only if you're sitting in the center, up mixing actually creates a center channel. So when you have a speaker connected to the center channel, you can sit anywhere. You can sit on the left or the right, but the center sounds will still come from that center speaker. And this is now being used in many cars to make both so uh, the sound similar from both front seats. Now, if you want to upgrade an upmix system and support the upmixing, you have to have center channel support. Audison has always had this built in since the original bit one. Now, upmixing used to be defeatable in most OEM systems. In those cars, you could turn off Logic 7 or Center Point or whatever the OEM called it, and then you unplug the center channel speaker, and then you integrate your system normally, everything's fine. But I've seen several systems over the past few years with up mixing that is always on. There is no off button. And if you disconnect the center speaker in that car, you're gonna lose all the sounds that come from the center of the stage. And that includes all the vocals. That's not good. Uh, so you're saying we need to retain the up mixing in th those cases. Some of those up mixing, I can guess, have lots of channels, right? Yeah, that's one of the reasons the Bit Virtuoso has pass-through mode. Uh, pass-through mode allows you to take whatever presentation mode the OEM system is using without forcing you to sum channels back together if that's not what you want to do. Uh, for instance, if you have rear speakers and then rear effects speakers in an OEM system, you shouldn't sum them together. They should stay separated. And on this image, you can see a Bit Virtuoso being set up for pass-through mode in a pretty complicated OEM system has an active two-way center, active three-way front doors, active two-way rear doors, and rear effect speakers, and a subwoofer. And all of these are being passed through the Bit Virtuoso. Now, after you upgrade an upmix system with proper tuning, you can get the same sort of thing from the driver's seat, but you can still get a center image from the passenger seat. And that's really great to offer to a customer. Oh yeah, that's great. Are there any other reasons to use pass-through mode? Well, there is another approach OEMs use that uses all pass filters to manipulate phase. And some people call that phase equalization. That's so what, what are they doing? They change the phase in very specific areas of the sound to reduce the cancellation in both front seats. And it isn't perfect, but it is symmetrical. And I'll, I can show you an example using an all pass filter. Hold on, hold on. Maybe someone here, including me, doesn't know much about the pass filter concept. Can you try and explain? Yeah, sure. I didn't understand all pass filters until about three years ago, so I understand. <laughs> so most filters attenuate that we are familiar with, crossover filters and notch filters. All pass filters do not attenuate. They flip the phase 180 degrees. It's kind of like flipping the positive and negative speaker wires, but only within a defined range of frequencies. So if you're using an all-pass filter, it's often called phase equalization because you're changing the phase at some frequencies, but not at other frequencies. Now, it is difficult to measure phase directly. It is easier to see the effects of phase cancellations than to measure phase itself. But let me try to show you a comparison. Now, this example here, the channel one is the black line, and it's the same phase all the way through from lows to highs. Now, the red line on channel two is not. There's an all-pass filter on channel two, which inverts the phase. You can see where it hits 180 degrees and then it comes back. And the easiest way to see this in a car for us is to look for cancellations. And this next graph, where have we seen cancellations recently? Here, between the left and the right speakers. So here's how OEMs use the, the all-pass filter technique. The biggest cancellation on this chart is around 200 hertz. So now let's put an all pass filter just on one channel at 200 Hertz. So we will invert the phase at 200 Hertz just on one side. And this yellow rectangle here represents an all pass filter. And this is similar to the user interface you see on the Bit Virtuoso when you're using the D phase process. Now, when you turn it on, 
you will notice we now have a flat response at 200 hertz. The two channels were out of phase. We flipped one 180 degrees at that frequency. Now they're back in phase at the listening position. No more cancellation at 200 hertz. So uh, OEM that is using this basic uh, phase EQ uh, is Toyota. And in this Toyota Tacoma, if you were testing to see if it had phase EQ, you would hear the mid bass in the middle of the windshield from either front seat. But what about the other frequencies then? Well, what I showed you is just basic phase EQ. It only improves that one point. There is phase equalization. There are systems with a lot of phase equalization. Uh, it's fair to say that even the most complex two seat phase equalization system doesn't have the same precision imaging as the one seat systems that we use with delay. Now, once the OEM system has manipulated phase like this, mm -hmm. delay will not work the way we expect it's going to. There's no one certain value that we can enter into our bit to get delayed to fix this. Once the two channels are not in phase with each other at all frequencies, delay won't work. The bit virtuoso has D phase, which can correct phase and allow us to use delay again. In a future episode, you and I will show the viewers how to do it, right? That's right. And I, I am really looking forward to that episode. You can also use the pass-through mode here. Why would you use pass-through mode if you can correct the phase then? Well, passing the signals through lets us retain their two-seat processing, right? Now, we may not feel that that is as good as one-seat processing with delay, but some of our customers like it. And we can still use upgraded amplifiers and upgraded speakers and use the equalizer inside our processor and get much better sound this way. That's a lot of processing. Aren't there ways to just eliminate all of it? Sometimes there are. Sometimes there is an unprocessed analog preamp signal, not as often as there used to be. Or there may be a way to turn off some of the processing using a vehicle programming tool. But most of the time, the way we do it is with this class of vehicle specific devices, and I call them external preamps. They eliminate all of the OEM processing and retain the functionality of the OEM volume control on the steering wheel. Like our BDMI maybe? Yeah, exactly. Uh, the bit DMI connects to the most network in the car and gives you unprocessed stereo spit if digital audio. The first generation of bit DMI works with many European vehicles with most 25 networks. The next generation of bit DMI will support the new most 150. We are working on a new interface in cooperation with iDataLink company. Did you know that? Yeah, I, I did. I've used a lot of bit DMIs and BMWs, for example, and the sound quality has been excellent. And I am really looking forward to testing out the most 150 version in some of the newest cars. Sure, Ken. As you know, good things comes for those who wait. For the moment, what can you tell me about iDataLink Maestro and Audison? Well, iDataLink is a, has an amplifier replacement interface called AR and it eliminates all the OEM processing that's used in many Chrysler, Ford, and Toyota audio systems. And those systems don't use most 25, so you can't use a bit DMI in those cars. And the AR is going to cover more vehicles very soon. Okay, so Audison has Maestro AR support in the AP bit amplifiers and in the bit Nova processor. Yeah, the AR uses the bit processor as the preamp. So the volume up and down and the fader front to rear commands are executed in the bit processor when you use the OEM controls. It's really cool. Okay, so moving forward, what can you tell me about other problems in OEM integration you can mention? Well, we can't just hook up speaker wires and expect everything to work anymore. <laughs> yeah, most, well, install <laughs> most installers have heard of cars that mute the outputs after the OEM speakers are disconnected. And mm -hmm. I get questions about this all the time for Chryslers and Volkswagens. Um, and in some new cars, if you disconnect the speaker, you will actually get a diagnostic trouble code. And you might even get a call from the telematic service provider to see what's wrong with your car. Really? Why would they do that? Well, the telematic service can call the car in case of an accident and ask if you need emergency help. So if your sound system stops working in an emergency, there's no more hands-free call audio. So you could be stuck in your car and you cannot hear the operator talking to you. Okay, so I guess that's quite important to be working correctly all the time. Sure. 
<laughs> if you want to avoid this, the OEM system has to detect a load that simulates the original speaker. Uh, and that sounds like our universal speaker simulator technology. Yeah, that's it. Now, USS emulates the missing speakers, so the factory system doesn't even notice that we have changed anything. And I have to tell you, I'm really impressed with the commitment that Audison has made to USS products. Yeah, right. We have the USS embedded in the APF 8.9 bit, bit Nove, bit Virtuoso, and the complete line of SR amplifiers. Then we have it also on the SLI2 and SLI4. These are line output converters from our connection brand. Um, of course, the USS4 is also provided as, as a standalone solutions for products out of this list. And later this year, we will also have it on the B10. We really and honestly think have addressed this issue more comprehensively than any other company. So our dealers can move forward and not to worry about it. Yeah, it's very encouraging to see a manufacturer taking things like this so seriously. Um, and speaking of which, another serious roadblock is ANC. ANC? Uh, it's active noise canceling. It's the microphones in the headliner. Oh, yeah, those. So ANC microphones are one of the most common problems in OE integration that, that I hear about. And it's because the ANC system listens for unexpected sounds. Adding a subwoofer definitely qualifies as unexpected sound, maybe? Yeah, it definitely does. So the OEM system hears the bass, and it adds more bass to the signal to try to cancel out the subwoofer using the subwoofer. So a positive feedback loop is the result. The louder the subwoofer gets, the more signal is added. Yeah, that sounds as a very obvious problem. What's the answer? Well, if you use an external preamp, like a bit DMI, or a Maestro AR, the problem is solved. When a product like that isn't available, you have to disconnect the ANC microphones one by one, or you have to disconnect the ANC brain most of the time. And this is one reason that I recommend that specialists subscribe to repair service information, because you can usually find the microphone wire colors and the pin locations in those wiring diagrams. Okay, fair enough. It looks like a lot of things to keep in mind anyway. Yeah, there's a lot to keep in mind, and we'll go into these processes more in next episodes. Yeah, so yeah. Mm, going to tools, uh, what are some tools you can recommend that car stereo specialists could have on hand to deal better well, with the OEM? Well, it's absolutely critical that you have a voltmeter. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> now, it's also really important that you have a polarity tester. You have to be able to test the OEM outputs from the system to make sure you know what polarity they use because sometimes they change it. And you need to test all your speakers after your installation to make sure they are all correct. Now, nowadays, it's also really essential that you have an oscilloscope. Most of the time, a voltmeter is what specialists use to measure DC voltage and DC resistance. But oscopes can measure AC. And that shows us when the AC signal starts to clip. So they're really handy for audio work. Now, we also need an RTA or a real-time analyzer of some kind. Now, remember how oscopes measure AC? Now, an RTA is a way of measuring AC at multiple frequencies at the same time and displaying it to us on a graph similar to the ones we've been showing you. So if we use an RTA with a measurement microphone, we're measuring the AC voltage coming out of the microphone after the air pushes on the capsule. But when we use an RTA with test probes, we're measuring the AC voltage on its way to an amplifier or on its way to a speaker. Now to do all that, it's essential that you have a selection of test tones. And we used to use those on CDs and a lot of people still use them on CDs. I have a USB stick and I also have an app on my phone that does my test tones. Yeah, you know, all of these things are built to, into the Audison B tune. Yeah. Oh, look, you have one. <laughs> so if you have one of these, it does all that. Yeah, to encourage uh, the use of this fantastic device, Audison has opened the measuring functionalities to all B tune owners without the needs of purchasing a license any longer. You can see this, how many instruments this fantastic product is replacing. 
That's right. Audison has been encouraging the use of all these tools and they've made them available inside the bit one for years. You're making a good case that the modern car audio dealer should be in business with Audison. We have been doing training on how to do these things for many years and we offer the widest selection of products to help dealers be successful. We have been committed to using DSP in OEM integration and tuning longer than anyone else. Hey, we didn't say anything about speakers. Maybe it's time to. <laughs> Let's talk about speaker. Audison makes number of excellent speakers divided in three lines. Here is the thesis, our high-end line. And then we have the voce, the premium line. As in our tradition, both for two and three ways. And then the Prima line, so-called the OEM integrator. With 18 available models. And we are not counting here the Prima subs. I've been asked by dealers before, what makes Prima speakers an OEM integration speaker? I mean, speakers are speakers, right? And my answer for that is, first of all, it's the variety of different models. You have 18 different models, so you're going to have something that fits in the factory location. The second thing is the dimensions that you build the Prima speakers to. They're not too deep, they're not too wide, so they are also very likely to fit in that OEM location that you have available. And the third thing is that you optimize the performance of them to be in the, uh, the factory location. So the different sizes you have definitely help in certain pass-through applications. Um, give me give you an example. Let's say we have an OEM system that is using phase equalization and the channels are not in phase with each other at all frequencies. So those systems often use a wideband speaker in the dash playing mids and highs and then a woofer in the door playing bass. The crossover point is too low to work with a six and tweeter component speaker set. So you might think we need to sum them together. But if they're using phase EQ, we do not want to sum them back together to full range because we would get cancellations where the two channels are not in phase. Let me show you an example. Here's the high pass channel in one of these systems. And now here is the low pass channel. And it looks as if they should sum together just fine. And the reason is that RTAs do not measure phase. They will not show us the phase. So if you look at these two lines, it looks like they would sum together to a perfectly reasonable full range signal. But when you do sum them together, what you get looks more like this. It is not a good signal to use at all. And these purple arrows will show you exactly where the cancellations are happening. Now here's something that you can do with Prima. In this example, you could use the eight inch Prima woofer. You could use a six inch Prima woofer. I'm using the six by nine Prima woofer to replace the six by nine used in this Bose system. And here we're going to replace the OEM wideband speaker with an AP2. This is the aluminum two inch speaker that I uh, came out, I think about a year ago. Now, if we upgrade both speakers this way, we have a six by nine in the door, we have the AP2 in the dash, we don't have to sum at all to upgrade the system. Now, many automakers are using this approach. If you look here, you can see a number of different manufacturers are using the woofer in the door, two inch in the dash approach. Wow, that's quite impressive. By the way, the, the Prima speakers also are designed for high efficiency. Yeah, and that's really important if you're looking for best results with medium power amplifiers, whether the amplifiers are the factory or uh, an aftermarket. Yeah, Prima Coaxial have a design not found in many speakers. Concentric tweeter inside the voice coil of the woofer. Also, there's a waveguide around the perimeter of the tweeter dome to act as a buffer. This reduces interference between the tweeter and the woofer, and we feel it improves dispersion and off-axis response as well. It also really helps it fit behind some factory grills. Yeah, and that's a good point. Is it enough for speaker for the moment? Yeah, I'm sure we'll get into it more in that later episodes. Okay, so now finishing with the OEM integration solution, you said before that peripherals are important. Yeah, I hope one of the things you've noticed here is that there are a lot of variables in OEM integration. Now, sometimes we need a master volume control, and sometimes we need a speaker loading interface, or sometimes we need a high voltage interface, or sometimes we need an external preamp to take the audio out of a digital network and make it something we can use. 
Odison has some really valuable peripherals. We've already talked about BDMI, our most interface, and the USS technology and how they can solve common issues on modern cars. But going back to our DRCMP, apart from let us overcome dynamic equalization effects on the sound, it is also a piece of design. In, in the next slide, you can see how it nicely fits in the dashboard, also thanks to the RGB LEDs, which is provided that can be adjusted to match with the illumination color of the instruments. Then we have the DRC-AB. This is the lower cost controller that uses volume up and down buttons, again, in this environment of use. Now let's talk about an accessory, the C2O an innovative device that lets your digital coaxial or analog high resolution audio player to be connected to the toss link input of your bit processor. It gives added flexibility to the connectivity of your system, giving you the possibility to explore quality and contents of your mobile devices, IRES. Now let's step into the SFC the sampling frequency converter that can transform different optical or coaxial signal into 44.1K for use with bit processor. Easy to install and connect as you can see in the following diagrams. SLI 2 and 4. These are ultra high fidelity line output converters with the USS built in and that can handle signals up to 35 volts. Yeah, I tested these recently and they're possibly the best passive line output converters that I've ever seen. Glad to hear that. Now, SPM4. Here when you find two more channels that you don't expect, the stereo passive mixer can sum four channels down to two. So you don't have to upgrade to a larger bit processor. Here an example on connecting diagram. So in conclusion, Audison helps specialists get great results by undoing OEM processing and then providing the tools to get great sound in cars. Part of the magic of bit processor is that they have tools to undo OEM processing and they have tools to improve the sound of our upgraded sound system. We're almost done, dear guests. We hope you enjoyed this first episode. We have covered much information and we know many of you must have questions. Please do it here live, activating the Q&A function as shown in the next slide. We're waiting for your questions here. Come on, don't be shy. We got some greetings from the beginning of the episode. Yeah, hello everybody, Glenn, Mark, how are you? So guys, no questions. Anyway, uh, if you're shy or will you do a bit to one seminar? Uh, hey Scott, will you send the link for this webinar? I'm starting uh, replying from uh, Scott, a uh, bit one uh, HD seminar. Actually, this will be the last episode of this series will be completely dedicated to the B1 HD. And uh, will you send the link for this webinar? This I'm answering to Mark. Hi, Mark. How are you? Um, um, yes, um, all the replays of these webinars will be published in the registration page once uh, the webinars will be over. Uh, anything else? Anyone else? Prego. Uh, I see a question here from Jason asking if there's a tool that can test phase at the headrest. Uh, the answer, that, as far as I know, to answer that question is yes and no. There are uh, different professional level tools that can measure phase absolutely, but I find phase measurements to be a little bit confusing because we don't hear absolute phase. We hear how phase from one speaker and phase from another speaker interact. That's the biggest problem. And so the if you use a bit one HD virtuoso and you use a bit tune with it, its percept system will measure phase, but it won't necessarily give you the measurements that you're asking about. 
It will also test polarity. If you're using a bit one HD virtuoso, it will test speaker polarity at the listening position um, and tell you if that's correct. But if you're looking for the number, um, you would have to use a professional level tool to do that. I find that what we're really looking to do is correct the response that phase causes rather than change phase uh, directly. Um, and I'll, uh, we wanna simplify that process. Does, does that make sense, Luca? Yeah, yeah, it does. Now I'm taking care of Elmar Michaels here, he's a German friend. Uh, yes, I will see you there, Elmar. Hang on. Then, then there's Lens that is asking which processor offer USS4. Uh, objection, Your Honor. Mr. Mason is leading the witness. <laughs> uh, so, believe the processors that involve USS4 are the Nove and the Virtuoso, and then later this year, the bit the 10, 10 will get that 10. feature, is that right? Yes. And the Forza amplifier with bit processing inside. Yes, correct. correct. How'd I do, Len? Yeah. Uh, tra we got Travis, that's it. And that's late in Australia, isn't it? What the number? Ah, the microphone that I was holding up, Travis, uh, was for this NTI handheld. I actually have a couple of different NTI handhelds. This is the uh, the top of the line model that they have um, and the microphone can plug into it. I actually rarely use handheld RTAs with microphones. I usually use them just to measure the voltage on the wires directly because once I climb in the car, I'm old and it's hard to climb back out of the car. So I wanna take everything with me when I climb inside the car. But uh, um, th that's made by uh, NTI. Um, there's Luis from Portugal. Ah, uh, Luis, um, if you are trying to compare two channels to see how their phase compares, you can use a two-channel oscilloscope, but there is another way to do it. And if you use the, uh, if you use the Bit1 Virtuoso software, it will show you in the D-phase process where it will take the left and the right channels and combine them together, and you can look for cancellations, just like those charts that I was showing you. So it turns out to be simpler to sum two channels together and look for cancellations than it is to actually look at the sine wave. Especially if the sine wave is in the stop band of a crossover, it's harder to see what the phase is down there. So I recommend the summing process. And apparently uh, that is also what you see when you use the Virtuoso software. Then the Richard Harding that is asking that that's possibly regarding the start and stop issue going up and down? Well, I think that some of the newest products have stop, stop start support in them. I think there is a, another peripheral that we did not mention that supports start stop for the classic products that didn't have it built in. Yeah. So what's the name of that product, Luca? Oh, the, um, oh wow. We didn't mention that. It is, uh, there is one on the, I, I thought we I knew and stabilizer, we something like that. Yes, but we get back to Richard on this. But anyway, that's uh, uh, as up far to as 32 six. volts. As far as 32 volts goes, Richard, I've been reading stories talking about 48 volts for 20 years, and I still haven't seen it yet. So I'm not going to yes. worry about it yet. But no, I'm sure no, it's going to happen. And on top, on top of this, on top of this, uh, um, um, the new the new products the new amplifiers and dsp have a wider scope of uh, voltage compatibility so it's much harder to turn it on and off in accordance to the start and stop uh, action uh, when we present this in china they just say we just taking off the start and stop <laughs> that's a radical solution uh just hi uh how are you uh, when will most 150 DMI available? Uh, on this, uh, I'm going to repeat what this says to, to Ken. Good things come for those who wait. No, apart from jokes, uh, is in development. I wish to have it as a Christmas gift, but that's not a promise, okay? They didn't tell me either. <laughs> All right, uh, Kimo, um, is there automatic stereo image adjustment in bit processors with mic and test tone? Uh, not exactly. Uh, the bit tune will tune the system for you and locate the image. But I'm going to answer that question a little bit differently. If you have set your delays properly and you don't have the image where you want it, you have an image, 
but you would like it to be farther to one side or the other, correct that in level because the delay is not what positions the image. The delay is what solves the response cancellations and the level is what positions the image. So if your image is too far to one side or too far to the other side, start with delay and then look at EQ and leave your delay alone. I'm sorry, start with level, look at EQ, but do not mess with your delay. That's how I would adjust that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talking about EQ. Uh, okay, no, I, Rob Wempy won a prize. Uh, one drink on me or more. ES3 Thanks, is the accessories and blame on me, okay? Uh, Rob's such a product guy. Yeah, thanks for bailing me out on that, man. Diego, Diego Baez, uh, I'm going to reply to you, Diego. Puedo hablar en español también. Uh, un Jeep Rubicon 2020 uh, se merece un Bit1 HD virtuoso. Only the best for you, okay? But of course, uh, we need to analyze further, Lee, and if anything, get back to us. Lo siento, Diego. Mi español es muy poco y muy mal. <laughs> Hello from Singapore. Wow. Uh, 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 any Odison DSP with true center channel up mixing capability like Logic 7 or Dolby 7 or just some left and right things? That's, that's what we were discussing the other day, that uh, the processing uh, and the decoding of the Logic 7 doesn't happen inside the, 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 the processor itself, Ken. Yeah, the, the answer to your question is no, there aren't any Audison products that do that. And uh, right now, there aren't any products on the aftermarket at all that I know of that use DTS or Dolby Pro Logic 2 or Logic 7. Um, there were some products like that in the past and they aren't available anymore. Um, and that, that's the best answer that I have for you right now. Right? Um, we, we are supporting, up, we're approaching up mixing right now from an OEM integration uh, point of view and not from an upgrade point of view. Uh, so what did you say on the info on the vehicle audio processor factory mix pin location could be found? That was a service you were suggesting, right? Um, in the US, and I cannot speak for countries outside North America, but in the US and Canada, there are two vendors that offer subscriptions for looking up wiring diagrams. One of them is ProDemand, and that's the one I use. And then there's one called AllData. And their customers generally are auto repair shops who are not auto dealer, they're not official dealerships, so they don't have official access. So they buy it from a third party. And so ProDemand is the company that I use for that sort of thing. So Tim Stella is saying, I have an Alfa Romeo 4C, lucky you, convertible and Beautiful would like stuff. to improve the system. The head unit is Alpine. What processor could be added? The door speakers are 5.25 inches. I think we need more information on this, right? Um, I would like to connect, Tim, I'd like to connect you with a specialist. I've actually upgraded the audio in a 4C. It's a wonderful car, but man, getting out of that car, I feel like I'm falling off a train, um, but it's a beautiful car. So, um, but we should connect you with a specialist who can help you out there. And I've done that car. I can provide whatever information I can, but probably offline. Uh, Jimmy Bradfield. Hey, Jimmy. Um, that was actually a Tacoma. Um, and in the next episode, we are going to show you how to use different processors to overcome that problem. You can do it with a Virtuoso, but there are also some ways to do it with other processors. And I'm going to show you some techniques in the next episode. Um, I got great improvement in sound with Audison products. Treble sounds really nice, but mid-bass speakers, AP8, they're not kicking really. I've used 4.9, the EQ, other features, but the bass is still quite weak. Been wondering if there's something wrong with the configuration or it is just how it is. The car is an Audi A4 V9 2016 with basic audio system. My my experience, and I have not done that car with basic audio because the A4 does not come to the US with basic. It just comes with medi medium and, and premium. But um, my experience in pro with problems like this is nine times out of 10, it is the integration from the subwoofer to your mid-bass speaker. And there is some cancellation happening in the crossover overlap. And 
So most of the time it is a tuning question. Sometimes it is how the eight inch woofers are installed in the door, but my, I don't usually, I usually I do this with six and a halves rather than eight inch speakers, right? And they have less output than eight inch speakers. And the trick for the integration is always the, the delay and the, the phase and polarity at the crossover point. So yeah, let's test Olga in. Hello everyone, when using optic signal as we know, otherwise we have a distortion entering the processor. Fabian Cajas. Uh, so uh, Hubert, um, different equalization at different volume. Is there a tool in Audison bit processors that can make different EQ at different volume? Uh, yes, there is an in some in two ways. One of them is that uh, uh, as Luca can uh, confirm on the models, if you use the DRC, you can have a different volume at low levels and or sorry, different equalization curve at low levels and a different equalization curve at high levels. And I think that's the bit one and the bit one. The bit one for sure, level. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I believe there is a way in the bit, well, actually, I think that is the answer to your question. Yeah, and then hello everyone. When using optical signal, as we know, otherwise we have distortion entering the processor. Well, I don't think if you adjusting well the distortion of the source, right, Ken? I, I think what you may be referring to, and I apologize if I misunderstand this, um, if you are conveying a SPDIF digital stream and you carry it over optical, you may have more errors in the digital stream than if you carry it over coaxial. Now, there is an argument about how much error we hear, right? If the error is bad enough, it skips. We know this from when we used to scratch our CDs and we would put the CD in and the, it would skip. That was an error in the digital stream. Um, but beyond a certain point, if it doesn't sound like a skip, whether or not it is damaging the sound is a topic that we can only argue about at the bar, right? Um, so what we are talking about with OEM integration is not necessarily the kind of, can we hear that problem that high-end audio concerns itself with, whether it's home or car. We are concerned about what I call the big rocks in the road. And so phase cancellation between left and right is a huge problem, right? Digital jitter is real, but if it's not horrible, it is a much smaller problem than left and right cancellation. So we're trying to focus on the biggest problems with OEM integration. Does, does that make sense? Yep. So you recommend, yes, Jas, um, of course. You, I recommend a data link IR for integration by the Donut Cover European vehicle. Some of them, they might, I think, uh, but very few. Whip. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, Kimo, uh, do I hear right at new SLI line converters can handle up to 35 volts? Um, absolutely right. I tested it on the bench. I have video I can send you. Um, do they recognize class D signal? Uh, transformers don't care. Uh, how about wattage? Um, well, in this case, the wattage is the voltage. I am very familiar with BMW Harman Kardon. I own BMW Harman Kardon. You are my brother. If we have those cars um, and it's actually, if you do the math, it is like 105 watts into the eight ohm woofer speaker. So this product is perfect for BMW. Now you do need to still find a turn on wire. It will not signal sense reliably in that car as far as I know. But as far as BMW woofer integration, this SLI is perfect for BMW. So, Yes, this is also done. Um, 6.52 ohms with help as well. I don't know what Lance is referring at, but probably uh, yeah, was that maybe this? Audi. Yeah, Fabian. These are great questions, guys. Thanks. Yeah, let's lot uh, finito. Let's start the stop. Sure. Oh, oh yeah. Thanks for sure. So, okay. Kimo, yeah, it's also in. I think we've so, gone, we've went through all of them, right? 
Well, if you have a question after we are done, and this happens yes. every time I do a class, can, I think you, you have can go in the next slide. Yes. For those of you who may be shy or for if we didn't have time, because we need to close it up, the company, because it's uh, past 8 p.m. here, wow. while it's morning in, uh, in the U.S. So uh, you can refer to this, uh, to this email address on which it will be uh, handling your request uh, from here until the next episode or anytime you want. Okay, so coming back to us, uh, the last thing has left is uh, talking about the next episode contents. And as you can see in, in the next image, and uh, again, keep in mind uh, that uh, the, the, the data has changed. So OM improving made easier in the next slide, uh, approaching uh, the OEM uh, upgrade, where to start from. Uh, amplifiers with DSP. Uh, there's no slide on the, there's no sharing slide here. Here we go. Thanks, Matteo. Wednesday, 30th of September, from good to great, the OEM upgrade made easier. Approaching the OEM upgrade, where to start from? Amplifiers with DSP and their use. Standalone DSP and amplifiers, how to optimize this combination. Uh, speaker replacement, how to choose them. It's gonna be fun. So, uh, thanks for being with us today. Thanks to Ken Ward for his support. And see you all next week. As we say in Italy, ciao. <laughs>